Next topic is all about uh, uh, decentralized financial services. So we are, we are almost moving away from a very centralized financial service industry, which I, I think uh, um, is something uh, more over time. And it's a very interesting topic because we see first decentralized application in financial services besides gambling and uh, gaming as the leading uh, industry for decentralized application. And before we, we uh, uh, deep dive into the topic, um, I would like to um, ask the panel to introduce yourself. You want to start from the... Yeah? Nadia. Hi, uh, I'm Nadia Filali. I'm a head of blockchain. Yeah. And Crypto asset program in Caisse des Depots. I'm also involved in Inadba. I'm a member of the board. And sorry, but I will introduce Mark Tavernel, our uh, new executive director. Mm -hmm. And I hope that many people will join us. Mm -hmm. And I am also uh, a member of uh, the working uh, group of uh, UECD, PPAB. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm involved in blockchain now for more than five years. And in Caisse des Depots, we are doing many things on the subject. Very good. Ulan? Hello, everyone. I am Uliana. I am co-founder at High Castle. It's a UK-based uh, uh, capital raising and uh, equity management platform. Uh, we provide our clients with a digital share register. Uh, we use uh, distributed ledger as an underlying technology to provide our registrar services. And uh, yeah, it's how we make actually securities, electronic securities, uh, uh, issued legally, legally binding, and uh, transferable as well, legally bindings. Mm -hmm. what? So I'm uh, Henrik. Um, I'm the co-founder and managing director of Berlin-based Finoa. Uh, we provide financial services on digital assets focused on institutional investors, uh, ranging from family offices, venture capital, asset managers, crypto asset managers, etc. Uh, the first product we launched early last year was a custody platform um, and um, now we're building on top of that additional financial services, crypto specific, be it uh, lending, staking, um, or even the uh, access to the liquid market uh, through trading. Um, what has changed in Germany very much last year, or this 1st of January 2020, is they introduced the BAF and introduced the crypto custody license. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to discuss this in the panel as well, how it's changing the whole market landscape in the German crypto industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my name is Martin Froehle. I'm the founder of Morpha. Uh, we are a trading platform based on the Ethereum blockchain that empowers its users to trade virtually any asset in the world with zero fees and infinite liquidity. Uh, we do this by replicating real world assets like stocks or commodities or cryptocurrencies uh, on the blockchain. So our users can build up economic exposure to the underlying without actually having to trade the stock. Very good. Thank you so much. And let me start, you know, um, you know in the community, the DiFi um, acronym is well known. Maybe, um, Hendrik, you'll start maybe now. What is the you know, decentralized financial uh, point of view? What are the services you see from your point? You mentioned already custody, etc. And then I will ask the rest of the panel too, because I think we'll, that's the, 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 the starting point, uh, what we are talking about. How, what's the, 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 the area? Yeah, I don't think there is a general perfect definition of what decentralized finance actually yeah. is. I mean, a lot of people define it as cutting out intermediaries. Mm -hmm. Then um, I'm, I'm outing myself, building a, also a custody platform is kind of introducing a new intermediary yep. yeah. again, as the decentralized system has learned that uh, decentralization not always is the key to any solution. Um, and hacks and, and cyber attacks have shown why that is. Um, but at the end, it's the uh, try and a very um, um, big industry growing um, to reshape the, the financial industry, um, to introduce the new technology layer, mostly on DLT and blockchain technology. And if you really um, believe in the decentralization that's happening on public blockchains only, mm -hmm. and um, really distributing the responsibility, governance, and... Uh, um, yeah, control over a decentralized financial system. Mm -hmm. Ulana, what's your definition? Okay, I, I would say we are not really pro-decentralized uh, uh, with what we do in High Castle because we uh, operate our proprietary distributed ledger and it's a permission one. So yes, I would say like a ideal picture of the decentralized finance, uh, it's where everyone has access to issuance. 
uh, for me it's not reality because if you have like uh, free issuance of securities on Ethereum blockchain without any kind of control, so it's a mess and it's uh, a lot of clones which will happen and every finance uh, market will go up, will go down. Uh, so in our case, we um, we built our dis distributed ledger in a way that we provide access to this ledger to financial institutions who are regulated. So for me, it's uh, a way how we can decentralize influence and issuance and also transfers along uh, like uh, we've seen many intermediaries and many in regulated investment firms. So what's, your, what's your definition? Because coming from a well-respected financial institution, decentralized looks a bit chaotic and wild, uh, wild. so what's your, what's your take on that? No way you said that. <laughs> <laughs> we are in, the, in the, 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 the country of Napoleon, we know how to centralize it's, all. Yeah, and, exactly. <laughs> and Napoleon uh, created Caisse de Depot more than two, 200 years now, but we are working on the subject. And I think the, the subject is what will the attendees for the investors and the, the SMEs. So, the real uh, subject is if uh, decentralized finance uh, uh, facilitates the issue of the capital market for the SMEs, it's a good point of view. Uh, it's the same for the consumer. If they want to, in to invest on what they want without uh, constraint, it could be a, a good way. But we have also to be careful about uh, some points and to be uh, sure that uh, all the market is secure and is not too much uh, going up and down every time. I think it's, it's, uh, it's a point. But today we know that there is a paradox because there is money to invest in many things, but it's difficult to invest now. And for the investors, it is difficult for the issuer to find money too. And so, uh, for us, it's important. And, and I think uh, Thibaut Maintenant was in my chair in the beginning, and we invest in, in Liquid Share. Uh, he was one of, uh, of the, the, the first stakeholders of, of Liquid Share. And we think that it's an evolution of the capital market on the one hand, and it's very important. It could be also important in loans, not only on capital market, mm -hmm. and in perhaps other services. So uh, I think it's a, good, it's a good idea. It's a great idea. There is also all the subject around uh, stable coin or settlement coin or making the link between the, the crypto asset and the real finance or the real world. So it's important for that. Uh, but we are pragmatic at Caisse de Depot, so we are looking at the things, we are working in it, we trust in it, and we will do this with secu uh, security and uh, confidence. Mm. Martin, what's your take on the definition and, and use cases? I'd go very much with the definition of eliminating the middleman from transactions, and okay. uh, finance is actually full of middlemen, as we all know. And uh, I believe this will be an important change in the financial industry uh, powered by blockchain. So blockchain makes this possible in the first place. And we will see a huge trans transformation in the next couple of years. Um, DeFi, uh, to be fair, has become, or decentralized uh, systems have become kind of a buzzword. And I believe we're not so much after the decentralization itself, uh, rather than after its properties, so rather than uh, what it really brings us. And to me, those are two things primarily. This would be transparency on the first uh, argument, and the second argument would be censorship resistance. So that's what we're really after. Uh, we're not so much after uh, having uh, our money de uh, stored in several decentralized places, uh, but we want to have it in a transparent way, and we want to have it in a censorship resistant way. So to me, that's what DeFi is about. No, I think these are two important criteria. So, so do you have an example of how this maybe will play out? Well, I can only speak for, for uh, what we are trying to build yep. here. Yeah. So um, in our case, we really want to eliminate the, the whole value chain from uh, banks, brokers, uh, exchanges, and then maybe fund companies that stand between the investor and their mm -hmm. product. Yeah. Um, and uh, we consider ourselves to be a consumer finance app, so uh, it's not necessary that our servers are distributed across the world. 
uh, or operated by a, a lot of different entities, uh, it's more important that uh, we replace middleman with a transparent and censorship resistant software solution. But, but are you not running into roadblocks? You know, you know the, the whole financial uh, system is, is organized in a totally different way. Um, and I think your aspiration is, you know, is, is something that the consumer would like to see maybe. Um, so what's your experience then uh, starting from that idea, those, those um, aspirational level, how, how is the execution, how is that, is that working? Uh, mm -hmm. w w what are your experiences in that? Because that's something that uh, uh, um, on paper looks good, yeah. um, but in an environment, in financial services, is a regulated environment, and it's all about trust, etc. So how, how, what, what, what are, you, first of all, your experiences, and what are the roadblocks that you, you, you already, maybe already experienced? Yeah, of course, there are roadblocks. Every time you do try to do something radically new, as we do, there are roadblocks. Um, we have asked ourselves the question, uh, what's broken with trading, and how should trading and investing be in an ideal world? So if you could build it from scratch, what would, you, what would everybody want? And the answers are kind of obvious. You wouldn't want to pay any fees for trading. You would want markets that are available 24-7. Uh, you would want to be able to have access to all the markets on one single platform, maybe, and not just uh, niche markets like stocks here and forex there. Um, and yeah, you want to have complete transparency about all transactions. You want to know what's happening. You want to know where um, token come from, where money comes from, where it's minted, where it's stored. So uh, we took that ideal world and we found that blockchain makes it possible. And yes, it's, it's an approach that's completely orthogonal to what happens right now in finance. And of course, we have to work within existing frameworks and within existing regulations. That's, of course, very important. Um, but still, even within existing frameworks and regulations, you can come up with completely uh, new approaches and orthogonal mm -hmm. approaches. So Hen Hendrik, what's your, what's your learning curve? Um, yeah, I wanted to ac actually add one of the, the barriers, because yeah. I think one is to find actually in our industry itself, because um, um, what we found in, in 2017 was that pure exaggeration of this suddenly unregulated decentralized market. I mean, buzzword ICO, and we are still overcoming that uh, prejudices and, and the negative sentiment that, that has been created in, in that time. And um, I think one of the barriers as well, and, and um, we might talk about one decentralized finance use case, which is crypto lending, uh, which is growing massively over the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. It's now a 5 billion US dollar industry. Yep. Um, and I, I actually read yesterday a, a, an article, again, um, from, a, from a crypto ideologist, and he was saying, this market has to grow much faster. Um, we, it's, it's great because there's no credit risk scores. Uh, everyone can, can get credit and stuff. And um, you kind of get afraid that this is just creating the next exaggeration because it's technologically possible and easy mm -hmm. and it's going so fast that it might overpace again. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's one of the barriers I see in, in our industry um, that we kind of run too fast um, and then have to like, kind of rebuild the house like we did to, uh, since 2017. Mm -hmm. now, what's your experience? Uh, any big barriers, roadblocks that um, is slowing down the, um, the adoption, the progress? I think uh, we have really big problem with uh, reinventing a wheel uh, and uh, actually using a wrong ter terminology uh, because uh, what have been existing on the public markets for like uh, for decades, like dematerialization of security, specifically when I talk about uh, capital markets, is now trying to be presented to the unqualified audience as some security tokens, right? But in fact, security token is just uh, technology term technological terminology which applies to existing uh, uh, legal process of dematerialization, right? And um, the problem, I would say, like with the mass adoption of the um, of the digital securities or electronic securities within within the private securities market is first of all to avoid the terminology of security tokens and whatever else. And um, so, um, yeah, and, uh, and like I have my 
<laughs> really special opinion on, on how distributed ledger, decentralized, like centralized, like uh, semi-centralized could be adopted uh, for, for public markets. So I would say like, uh, again, it's something that reinvent the wheel because uh, you have already a de depository systems which somehow operating mm -hmm. on the existing uh, um, technologies and I don't think they will be changing it like uh, uh, at all, like um, they might run some just slight modifications or some uh, separate uh, uh, pilots. Uh, but in fact, like depositaries have been issuing electronic securities for, for ages, right? And uh, we just, what we trying to do, we just trying to introduce an alternative, um, uh, much cheaper and affordable registrar system for private securities, mm -hmm. not trying really to uh, disrupt the public market which is already existing. So, Nadia, what's, you, what's your experience? You know, your um, Casa Depot is very known for innovation, working with startups. Any experiences with uh, companies out of the, the uh, of that space? Is that is something that um, um, any experiences, learnings um, that you would like to share? Um. Oh, on this subject, we work on, on different subjects and experimentation on Caisse de Depot and uh, on the, the real market, uh, because I, I saw Stephanie there. Uh, uh, we launched uh, with older banks uh, Liquid Share, mm -hmm. who is now working mm -hmm. on, on STUs and working on or f how facilitate mm -hmm. uh, the, the access to the market for SMEs, but also how to facilitate the, the reporting for, uh, for the regulator, how to facilitate how to work for all the the, the actors on, on the process, mm -hmm. and uh, what I, uh, I what I heard here, I, I have some 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 points. I I think if you want that DeFi works, we have to understand what at the attendees of the customer and if it's help them or or not. And um, yes, the finance is a re regulated work, and I will say yes and. Uh, it's it's a good it's a good uh, a good thing because uh, uh, there is a protection on the consumer on the consumer and investor. It's important, uh, and we have I think some com kind of paradox with the ecosystem now because all the people here are intermediaries, and we are talking about decentralized finance. Maybe uh, I come from a different angle. <laughs> Sorry, but. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I think this will evolve the, the roles. I think that's, that's also my understanding. My, my question is more, I see more traditional banks, even, you know, Jewish Bear last week uh, announced that they are even providing now to their wealthy business uh, crypto assets. Uh, they're working through uh, the okay. first bank, the Seba Bank, in which I have also mm -hmm. invested, um, offering those um, crypto assets, not uh, digital assets, crypto assets also uh, from a brokerage custody perspective mm -hmm. to their clients. Is there something that... Yes. I know you're ah, a very traditional house, no. but is this something that, that you would also oh, uh, consider? First of all, uh, the first time I talked with you here, the name of my job was Head of Blockchain Program, and now the name of my job is Blockchain and Crypto Asset Program. Okay, okay. It's the first, first thing. Second point is that we worked at Caisse de Depot for a client, a public client, that I will not tell the name here, I cannot do it, on the custody of crypto assets, and we develop inside Caisse de Depot our own technology on that, and we are continue to work uh, on the subject for this client, and we hope that it will be real in in few months. Okay, and the third point is that when I t we change the name of the program, we ask the question to the boss. There is a paradox because we don't know what we want to do on crypto. And so for the moment and until March, we have a strategic study on the point and what we will do or not do on the subject. Do we will open the subject in our investment or for our clients or not? And I saw that there is the the deputy head of CFO of Caisse de Depot there and uh, there are some people from uh, asset management here uh, with us, and so it's important to us to open the door because Caisse de Depot always innovates in finance. Perhaps you don't know that, but <laughs> we, we do many innovation in finance. 
um, some decade before, and we want to continue that. But because we are old, and because we know what, what is trust and what is long term, we have to look at all, all the points. So we are open to the subject. We are working on settlement coin. We are working on custody. Uh, we push and with uh, uh, liquid share and those initiatives for us, it's, mm. it's very important. But the, the point is that if you want th that works, we have to be careful that we'll, we'll have a real diversification of investment, that it's user friendly, because for the moment, the people who are going on that, they know the subject. It's a few words. And in the room, I think many of, of the people, if I ask who had crypto or something like this, everyone will, <laughs> perhaps not everyone, I saw one, I don't know if he's allowed to do, but, <laughs> but the, the people who said yes, but if we want that it's, grow, it, it's a, a real growing market, we have to be user friendly to the to customer and to be self secure and benefits. But let me summarize before I go back to Hendrik and and, uh, and Martin is um, I think we see a change. I think you know we, we were sitting here th two years or three years ago, and you know the crypto was for and not for specific for your institute, but in general, crypto was a topic that most of the financial institution didn't touch. I think now the technology is advanced from a security, from a scalability, user experience. I think we see now that uh, these crypto assets are me uh, make accessible to banking clients. Institution are now see this as an asset class. And so there's a change coming, or it's already going on. But going back to, um, to Martin and Hendrik here. Hendrik, um, you know, we went through a pretty depressive uh, time with, you know, falling out the, the ICOs that, you know, startups got easy money uh, and didn't spend wisely, etc. So my prediction was a few years ago, 90, 95% will not survive of those startups. I think we've been through that curve now. Um, we went through a crypto winter from, a, from looking at the, the whole crypto market valuation down to less than, what was it, 100, 150 billion. And we are recovering of that. So how do you see that marking, market evolving? It looks like maybe, there, maybe there's another turning point coming with the Bitcoin changes, etc. So I'd love to get your market perspective. And second question is also to Henrik, also uh, to Martin, also um, how we restore that confidence, the you know, the, uh, change the sentiment about that. Now, because I think we got pretty much hit by uh, bad behaviors uh, over the last few years. I don't want to give uh, like any price prediction. I'm saying it uh, already. Um, but no, what what we see definitely is that the, the the overall sentiment in the market has changed, and that is uh, especially true since the second half of 2019. Yeah. Um, we also see uh, a good amount of venture capital investment in this space again, especially after 2017. A lot of funds have like kind of uh, halted their investment because they wanted to see what what's going to happen, how is it the industry going to shake uh, and and turn out afterwards. Um, and what what I at least can observe is that. Um, those companies that either survived um, the, the crisis or came out after the crisis have a very different approach. Uh, it's much more on building legit infrastructure, legit products, legit financial services, other than just making the quick ICO and, and mm -hmm. become rich. And, um, mm -hmm. and that's, that's basically it. Um, so we see definitely that, that there is a lot of professionalism in the market. Mm -hmm. On the financial institution side, um, and um, I'm looking around um, to, to the other co-founders here, um, we also see that the market has changed a lot. I think um, conversations are approaching, and what I also hear very often is we are thinking or we are working on. I don't see too many uh, financial institutes actually active in the space. Mm -hmm. um, when I said working on, we have coders in the team, and when said working on, it's because we develop a solution, okay? Okay, okay. but this is not productive. Yeah, okay, um, fair, fair enough. Um, and um, so I think that that conversation has changed very much. And um, I think it's understood that this trend is not going to disappear. Um, and um, this is helping the overall um, industry very much. Um, mm -hmm. And then the second point is definitely um, regulation. I'm speaking for the, for the German market at least, which is very... Pro aggressively regulated mm -hmm. since January 1st. Um, and you 
definitely see, especially from traditional um, asset managers, traditional finance um, um, players, that um, this has changed the perception of the market, that uh, now at least the, the argument that, well, this is unregulated, I can't do it, uh, kind of disappears. Yeah. And this is definitely positive. Martin? Yeah, I would also say that the crypto winter since 2017 uh, was actually a healthy washout of the industry. Um, just like the bursting of the dot-com bubble was necessary in order to uh, make companies like Google and Facebook thrive now. So it was a necessary washout in my opinion and um, crypto and assets, every asset goes in cycles. We have experienced an exciting crypto uh, cycle uh, at the height of 2017 and uh, we're now right into the next cycle. Um, I don't believe though that the trust in uh, cryptocurrencies generally have been, has been shattered uh, mm. in the aftermath of, of um, 2017. So actually uh, if you uh, ask millennials uh, in which assets they would like to invest in primarily, uh, one of the first things that comes up is cryptocurrencies. And um, I think we're just at the brink of, of a new, very exciting cycle. There are trillions of dollars that are going to be passed on in the next couple of years from uh, the baby boomer generation to the millennial generation. And they are digital natives. And to them, it's, it's, it's clear that an asset that you just own digitally has the same value as the gold bar that you can also only hold in your hands maybe. Uh, so to them, their approach is, is a way more uh, natural approach to digital currencies. And I would say that uh, the trust generally in the asset class and cryptocurrencies per se has not been shattered, not even in mm. 2017. Well, from, a, from an investment point of view, I think, um, do you see, you know, I, I saw a lot of venture firms um, stepping in early uh, 2017 and step back again. Do you see that? That um, that the, the venture capital market is now again looking at at those startups, or is it early too early to say? Um, you know. Yeah, you will know. <laughs> yes, so um, definitely, like uh, venture capital firms are not looking for ICOs, so anymore because mm -hmm. not they don't have any any kind of trust into uh, some potential booming uh, Bitcoin. <laughs> Or, and and so on. And now it's absolutely obvious that all the ICOs, majority of them have, have been only the uh, securities, uh, which have been not even properly uh, organized. And um, I would say like, uh, within the all VCs, which we, ha we have now conversation, um, it's, uh, it's obvious that they have uh, a demand for a digital share registry, like uh, some other better way how uh, they hold actually um, securities shares in, in their portfolio companies. And uh, because for your understanding, like uh, private companies currently are holding their share registers on, on the spreadsheets. Uh, in best case scenario, they do it on a Carta, which is US-based uh, company. So that's why there is a demand for digitalization for issuance of electronic securities. Mm -hmm. They just like kind of uh, um, was hard point for us after the ICO because uh, every time you come to the um, <laughs> to the VC and, and saying yeah we uh, we help companies to issue electronic securities keep registry on a distributed ledger oh you do the, the, uh, the digital assets no 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 it's it's absolutely different because it's securities and it's always uh, have been like this right so this. Um, influence of ICOs has uh, kind of uh, had a bad influence on a market, on spe specifically on traditional players. And now through the education, uh, we are trying to, to bring a new understanding of this uh, value of this technology for a capital market, a specifically private capital market. Mm -hmm. Natya, any, any comments on that from a what, think, uh, what are doing the VCs on blockchain? Mm -hmm. Aria. What's your observation? Uh -huh. Um, I think there is two points. The, the first one, and uh, it, that was said by Benjamin before, uh, in the beginning we have many projects, many companies, many bullshit or so, and it was not a good point for uh, for the market. It's the first point. The second point, it's, it's almost difficult for VCs to understand this point because it's a technic technological point, and with some kind of 
a constraint with regulation. So for the moment, I think they are cold on the subject. Uh, everyone is not in the uh, in United States and uh, in Europe it's, I think, difficult for the moment to have some uh, investment uh, growing up in, in blockchain with the, with the VCs. We hope that it will change. Uh, for example, in the group, uh, BP uh, uh, France invest in uh, A5 uh, last year and we hope that they will continue to do that. But for me, it's a little bit cold. And the deal flow is not too big, if I can sell that. And is that also looking at the, the French um, startup community? Did, did you see that change also? That you know, it was hot a few years ago, and now it's, uh, the topic is, is less from an uh, interest perspective, not only from a VC, also from no, a, no, you know, yes, startup yes, I understand. Uh, uh, growth perspective now. There are some people in the room that they know that it's difficult. I know that's difficult for them every day, every day, and uh, uh, they are looking for their market. Uh, so it's a bit difficult. And because we are in a technology that we always say that it's not mature, and every year we invite some, we invent a, a new thing, and um, uh, we will we we need time mm -hmm. to have this development. And we need real investment, and not only you, you put a small ticket in a, in a company and you hope that it will work, because it need money, and you need a team with technical resource, so it's important for that. And um, we need to have some reality of the market. Mm -hmm. If someone develop a platform for STO, for an exchange, but if you don't have volume and the volume still very small, it could be difficult. Yeah. It, it's that point. So in France, the market move a little. We have we are less we have less project than in the beginning. The project that we have or the company that we have are more stable and more mature. And I think in the corporate industry, the project that we have are more mature and are going to industrialization, and it's a good point. But coming back to you, Martin, at the beginning you say you know it's trust, transparency, you know streamlining the uh, the whole value chain. If you look at the biggest one of the biggest highlights last year, it was the you know Facebook announcing Libra, which from my perspective is almost like a copy of a decentralized business model what the Ethereum Foundation did. No? Ethereum Foundation was very similar that. Uh, 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 Folks came together, built a non-for-profit organization in Switzerland, mm -hmm. uh, built the the underlying technology, and then uh, and firms like Consensus or other firms built application on top of that to monetize that. Mm -hmm. And 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 you saw the pushback on that mm -hmm. on Libra. So on the other side, it's confirming where you want to go from your business model perspective, because I think uh, Libra will will diminish or change the whole value chain in the you know card, credit card processing uh, go to a peer to peer model etc on the other side you know what you're saying you know the establishment pushed back on that pretty heavy that even the swiss government um, you know declaring end of last year that you know they might not get the license pretty soon so mm -hmm. any any thoughts about you know what happened last year in respect to, to libra and and the implication also for your business mm -hmm. Yeah, so with respect to Libra, um, I understand why regulators and um, maybe central banks even around the world are scared mm -hmm. because that would uh, put power over currency in the mm -hmm. hands of a private consortium, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but um, my point about Libra is uh, it has more in common with PayPal uh, or WeChat than it actually has with a cryptocurrency. Okay. Um, because Libra to, is... is a means of, of payment, and it's still based on fiat currencies. Uh, it's just a giant pool of fiat currencies, and yeah. the composition of the pool is chosen by a private consortium. Uh, but the consortium cannot mint or burn currency. That's, those are still the central banks. But still, they are afraid uh, of, of losing control. Um, and I think it was a healthy wake-up call uh, to central banks around yeah. the world and um, to, to maybe start thinking about their own digital, hopefully real cryptocurrencies and not uh, state-controlled uh, central currencies 
um, that can then trace every individual transaction and the only servers are at the central bank again and mm -hmm. uh, make basically getting rid of, of, um, of, of money that freely circulates. Mm -hmm. uh, which is not so much a problem, by the way, uh, in a democratic society like the European Union or, or the USA. Uh, but let's say in, a, in an autocratic state, uh, you wouldn't want to live in a state where the government even controls uh, every penny that you have in a wallet mm -hmm. and can check exactly who you have been interacting with in your whole entire life. Um, yeah, but uh, to, to sum it up maybe, um, I think the regulators are now waking up to uh, the potential of, of cryptocurrencies, of, of the potential of change, of impact that this industry is going to have mm -hmm. in the next couple of years. Um, and we're now in phase three, uh, where they fight you. Uh, and then in the end, phase four, you win. So first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then in the end, you win. Uh, that's um, common throughout a lot of uh, innovation cycles that we've mm -hmm. been through already. Kendrick, do you have similar um, conclusion out of the, um, the Libra case? Um, yeah, I think just as with decentralized finance per se, I think um, we will see a middle way, you know, a middle way between um, a completely decentralized currency, completely peer-to-peer, -peer, and something that is uh, central bank backed, for example. Um, I, I do see the point that in, in autocratic states uh, with hyperinflation whatsoever, and there are some good examples, with Venezuela, for example, um, um, stable coin, whoever issues it would create uh, mm -hmm. socioeconomic welfare. I see that, mm -hmm. that, that point. In Europe, um, the, the whole discussion about Libra being introduced, um, I, even if they did, I don't see that uh, um, many in the room here would literally, literally change from their um, Giro account with their um, corporate bank to actually using Libra, uh, because we, we know that tomorrow the Euro is just the same worth. Um, on the other hand, um, I think the technology and the discussions that are happening on central bank level are very fruitful. Um, although, again, the, the industry in, in, in digital assets kind of expects that if the European Central Bank comes up with a digital currency, it's going to be blockchain. But no one has said that either. It's like uh, they are exploring certain options and they're also looking at blockchain technology to use. Um, but you can very much also centralize and issue a digital currency with mm. great impact on, for example, the the negative interest rate environment and use it actually as a monetary policy without decentralizing the technology behind it. Mm. And there, I think we are at least two years away from it. I don't see that this is happening in the mm -hmm. Euro European monetary system anytime soon. Um, and Libra is kind of falling apart, to be, to be very honest. Mm -hmm. Not yet. I think the French government was the one of the first one pushing back on, on <laughs> Libra. Um, I'm not from the French government. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> so the question is, uh, do you think that there will be alternatives coming up in the French market, or is it, is it too early to say? We have an announcement from Banque de France uh, mm -hmm. a few days ago, but I will mm -hmm. let Banque de France talk about that in the end of, mm -hmm. of, of the meeting. And, I would do a, a joke that only French will understand here, I think, but I think Libra is a good news like the Minitel was a good news for Internet. And Libra, it's not only for me money. Mm -hmm. Libra, it's I about identity. Yeah. The first point is Libra, it's about identity, how you can manage all your transactions on Internet on each market, and if you are looking who, who were in Libra in the beginning, you will understand that point. And to have transaction on internet, you need money, but you need identity. But it's a very important point, and today you can see that all the governments mm -hmm. and the European Commission are working on mm -hmm. decentralized identity, um, digital one, and regulate uh, uh, state one, govern the one of your government. I will not say sovereign one because it's it's tricky. To, uh, it's, uh, it, there is two definitions on that. Mm -hmm. They are also working on some kind of. Uh, I will not say stable coin because if you're talking about eurocon, you don't need to have a basket of, of different crypto, of of, of different money. So uh, this this is a point. So I think it. it it's important to have this, ex this experience of Libra and because the, the, the restriction and the, 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 the things that we are talking about for now many years, even before blockchain, how you can manage your digital identity 
and on blockchain, how you do the link between the real market mm -hmm. and the cash, it's making moving the, the government. So it's a good news. Good. I think we have uh, still time for questions um, out of the audience. I think we have, I think, one microphone here, I think. So if you have any questions here to the panel, that would be fantastic. First row, I think we have a... Maybe you introduce yourself, maybe that's uh, just becoming... Yes, I'm Stéphane Salev, working at Société Générale. Société Générale, okay. Just a question about your, the private key. Okay, there's a one big issue with uh, DLT. It, it is the private key because all the problem with the private key is given back to the customer. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's assume I bought something with my computer and then I've, I've got a heart attack, which I'm not, I'm not willing to, but okay. And then nobody knows where is my private key. What are we doing with it? I mean, my wife, my children, do we get rid of what I bought because they will not be able to find my private key? It's a new form of consignation at Caisse des Dépôts, if we want. <laughs> no, it's a good point. But uh, for that, when we work about the, 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 the client for the custodian, we work a lot on this subject. And last year, we were talking a lot of that, about that with even uh, Eric Larchevet from Ledger. Uh, but you will, we will have some development of support. We have some support. And the difficulty, when, when I was talking about um, the, the facility for the customers to use, it's not true today. And if you are in a bank and you have to do a, an, operation, an operational process, it's difficult. And we discuss about that with the, the, the team, with the risk, uh, Unity 2, because effectively you have to do something. But you can imagine different kind of technology, you can do the multi, you can have a multi-sign key, okay? You can process on Shamir, it's not for the moment very, very mature, but you can imagine many, many things to do. And I think we, we will find the key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hendrik? Yeah, I want to add a point uh, to this. I mean, if you, if you talk decentralized finance and you talk to crypto ideologists, they will tell you, not your key, not your asset. I mean, that, that was where it started, because it really wanted to be decentralized without anyone interfering with your personal assets. Um, then, I mean, you very fairly say there have been multi um, thousands of cases where someone lost the computer, the phone, uh, the, the paper with a key on it, and was then wondering why the asset was gone. And, and that's why you see now that uh, actually some new intermediaries, and, and I include Finoa, um, evolve because especially institutional investors um, who play um, with large volumes of digital assets, they do want to do everything but handling the private key. And they are very happy to pay for the service to handle the private key. And I truly believe that the private key is going to disappear. Um, we're going to talk about it still. But um, to really reach mainstream in, in, in blockchain technology, private keys will be handled in the back end. It's going to be happening by financial institutions, players in the field, um, but not by the actual users. And um, I mean, private keys are also not completely new. They are used in the um, um, payment card industry, credit, credit cards. Every time you go to an ATM and put your, your, your credit card, there is a public private key connected to your PIN. Yes, so it's, but not, it's is, not completely new, it's just different. If, if you lose your card or you lose your key, you can talk to your bank, they stop the account and the transaction, and you will have a new one. Here it's not possible. Mm -hmm. It's a real difference. Huh? Yeah. Martin, final comment? It depends. So there are already <laughs> smart technological solutions that would allow you to recover your key. So there's two-factor authentication things. There's solutions where you have uh, where you send your encrypted private key your hashed private key to a third party provider so they don't have the key they cannot do anything with it uh, but you can redeem it from them and then decrypt it with another set of private public keys that you have on your computer so there are smart approaches uh, to to solve that mm -hmm. already on a technological front as well okay super thank you so much uh, coming to the end um, thank you so much uh, for sharing your insight your Projection. I think we will have more discussion later on on the privacy topic and compliance in the next session, stablecoin, and then the uh, feedback from the uh, from the. Uh
Banque de France. This is a very important, I think, important topic. So thank you so much for being on stage and please give them a big round of applause. Thank you so much.